Okay, so this is Leif Serrata here. I got a special guest, Matt Caruso. Um, I'm a momentum and breakout trader, and uh, Matt is someone I talk with, and I just thought it'd be really interesting to kind of bring him uh, into a video here. We could do a quick recording, and I like to call this edges and insights, because I'm looking for a little insight from Matt. I, we need an edge in uh, you know, trading energy stocks and swing trading energy stocks. We want to know about you know, metrics that drive them, uh, what to look for in a quality leader, and what is a leader. So, so Matt's a uh, U.S. investing champion, uh, top performer with his 346% return, which is awesome. And he does Caruso Insights. Uh, he's a pro trader and former professor. So, uh, you know, th this is something I like to do is dive into these kind of advanced topics on my platform. Uh, so this is the first time I'm kind of interviewing somebody else. So this, this, is, this is fun. Uh, got, we got Matt here. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, uh, Leif. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be your first interviewee here. So I'm glad yeah, to be it's, here. It's going to be cool because right now energy stocks are ripping. Uh, you know, oil prices are back at highs. And either this is the uh, perfect time to start swing trading energy or this is the top. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to see what we did, you know, when we play this back in a few weeks. But uh, there's, there's some setups and we want to know from you, like what you think about when you look at a good energy stock and, you know, are, are we falling into a trap? And you know, what are the metrics you look at that define the leadership? And I don't know if you could just give some insights and just tell us what you think. Sure. You know, it's funny. Uh, I think most even swing traders or, or most active guys are, are typically focus on these growth stocks, these momentum stocks. That's where a lot of the action is. And when it comes to these commodity stocks, I mean, there's typically, I find kind of a big question mark to a lot of people. They don't quite understand why an oil stock or a gold stock will suddenly have this explosive move. It's kind of maybe a little easier to visualize with a technology company changing right. the way we live day to day. But, you know, given my background for, for years when I was, you know, market maker here in Canada, our specialty was kind of commodity stocks, resource companies, whether it was, you know, gold mining or oil. So I had a lot of time to really dive into what was driving these things. And, you know, what's really interesting about them is um, for the longest periods of time, they're going to be really uninteresting. And, and the stock action is going to be trendless, probably downward trending. And then every once in a while, and you know, most traditional investors who are not focused in that sector will see this huge uptrend come out, won't know why it's there, when it's going to end and what's going on. But there's, there's some really specific drivers for that. And um, I, I guess I, th I think the best way to explain it would be, especially the commodity space is, you know, traditional stocks, it's greed that drives stocks higher, you know, and, and it's fear that drives stocks lower. That's why, you know, fear is a bigger motivator. That's why, you know, most drops, like uh, if you look at the COVID crash, it's, 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 you know, really fast down. So it's always stairs up, elevator down is the old saying. The commodity market, the demand supply is the actually the opposite. So it's funny, you know, you'll have commodities to kind of falling slowly for a long time and then spike because with commodities, the fear is on the upside. So for example, if you, let's say you look at the grain, the wheat market, corn market, the fear is that there's not going to be enough food for everybody. You know, when there's that drought, when there's a problem, that's when prices go up. The majority of the time, it's a boring market where things get delivered and it's actually a, a marvel of our, our modern, uh, you know, a free market system where everything just kind of works inexpensively and there's constantly new productivity bringing prices down. But when right. there's a shock to the commodity market, you get these explosive moves higher. Now, the reason that's, you know, people who are, are used to trading commodity stocks find it so appealing is that not only does the commodity spike higher, but put yourself in the shoes of an oil company. Let's say, for example, we're trading right now $80 a barrel. And, uh, you know, the, the, the company says, you know, it, I break even at $70, you know, so you have $10 of, of earnings per barrel. Now, if, if oil goes from $80 to 120, let's say there's a bit of a shock, you know, that's a 50% increase in, uh, in oil, five, zero, 50%. Yeah. But now instead of earning $10 a barrel, you know, this company's earning $50 a barrel. So, so their earnings went from, from $10 to 50. That's like a, a 500% increase. So that's a key so, metric that we got to figure out is key metric, key the metric, break, the break even, uh, right. The break even cost for that company. Right. Actually, absolutely. And, and that's yeah. one of the other big ironies of this sector is, you know, the quality stocks are going to be the first to move because big money is going to move into the yeah. more quality names, the higher tier names, uh, because they already do have earnings. But then after, you know, from a, uh, as, as the, a market gets really hot, you know, it's kind of the junkier names will have the biggest and fastest moves because there's right. some companies where, where they're actually, even at $80, they're not profitable. They're, they're bleeding. They cost them $85 to, 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 to take yeah. oil out of the ground. Then suddenly at $120, these guys will go from, from losing money yeah. to being extremely profitable. 
And that's what I was going to ask too, because there, there's a lot of companies that came out of bankruptcy and it almost yeah. feels a little dangerous to play with this, like a little bit like playing with dynamite or something. But, you know, they, they, I guess a lot of players got taken off the field, right? So uh, they reorganized and, you know, maybe maybe there's some danger too. Maybe we should know what to stay away from or, you know, some, some metrics for that. But I think more, more importantly for swing traders, we just have to figure out how to determine what's the leader. And like you said, what's going to move the fastest and maybe these junkier ones might go the fastest, right? I mean, potentially. Yeah. You know, I think the best way, you know, uh, once you, you figure out whether or not you want to be in the oil space, that's, you know, we can get to that a little bit later. I, I can explain why I'm, I'm bullish right now on the commodity itself, but then it really comes down to price action and, and it really your, your relative strength metrics, if, if, you know, whatever you're using, if it's a three month RS rank or other tools, you're going to see as, as the oil price moves up these, these lower quality names, or let's say these names that have a, a, a worse cost structure are going to suddenly start to outperform. So if, if, if I had to sit back and, and make a strategy, you know, you actually want to be in the better names at first and slowly as, as the trend picks up, you want to shift your money into lower quality names. That would be the optimal way to get the most money, but not easy to do, but yeah. you know, you know, theoretically that's actually the, 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 the chain of events as how it would go in a, in a bull market. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like that's, those are the ones that are setting up to my eye. Like I see like CRC is setting up and mm -hmm. you know, some of these ones that might, I think they're coming, that's coming out of a reorganization maybe or something. I, I'm just looking at that running down some of the names, but uh, I mean, maybe you want to, you could bring some up in a little bit, but you know, what, whatever, whatever else you think is uh, important, let us know. I mean, that's, we, we want to swing trade energy. So you got to teach us. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, you brought the reorganization. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I think that's right. really, these companies got so slammed in the past few years that, you know, they, they came out of, I mean, the, the risk was before they went bankrupt. You know, once they, once yeah, they went yeah. into restructuring and came back out, their debt levels are actually much lower and they have a much better uh, situation uh, that they're dealing with and uh, usually better governance structure. <laughs> So it really comes down to a lot of the um, uh, the technical action. And what's really interesting is if you go back and you look at oil stocks and bull markets, they act exactly like traditional growth stocks. So all the tools, I know you love um, your, your rocket bases, your flags. I mean, I know that that's your specialty and you're great at that. You know, those come up again when these are in proper bull markets because all right, the same right. things get in gear. You know, everyone sees, like I said, the earnings are going to go from, from $10 a barrel to 50 institutions are going to be running into these things as prices go higher. And that's where all these flags are going to come in. So it's really a matter of you want to sit back and analyze, you know, the price structure and, and see if that's really confirming the move. Yeah. I mean, just, we're looking at bases, uh, you know, the, the classic O'Neill stuff, it's got to set up in a base and I'm always just looking for a tight area on the end of a base and something that's moving fast. So, uh, you know, with a, with a low risk entries, of course, and, um, you know, the, these coming out of bankruptcy, they feel risky, but I feel a lot of them, they're, they're really moving well. And if, as the price of oil goes up, I guess that risk gets, you know, less problematic, right? Yeah. And, but, you know, like you mentioned CRC before, they have uh, more exposure to natural gas. So the commodity space, uh, you know, whenever you're dealing with it to avoid frustration, because I've, I've been there in, in the early days is you have right. this company that says something resources and you think it's oil or crude oil yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's natural gas. And, and they, you know, these markets, you, you'd figure they're, they're related. They are to some extent, uh, but they also have like really different demand supply structures. And, and you could see a okay. whole market in natural gas and oil's quiet or vice versa. So you really want to kind of dig in and, and see what the main. You want to see the, the percentages of, you know, how much is natural gas in the company yeah. and how much is, is crude oil and stuff like that, too, of course. Yeah. Like and, and almost all if you go to an investor relation website, they typically almost always have a company presentation. You got to maybe, you know, right, right. at first they'll seem a bit, you know, you won't know where to look. But once you, you find it in one, they're all pretty much the same thing. Yeah, you got you to gotta dig in a little bit. You got to do some, a little some bit. work there because they, they don't give it to you right on MarketSmith about the, the percentage. So that'll be <laughs> nice. And just a little hint for a Rusha or anybody listening, <laughs> you know. You know Know, the uh, break evens would be nice you know do all the homework for us based on what matt's saying uh how much is natural gas what percentage versus oil and some of them are a mix of course right so you just yeah. have to figure that out so yeah yeah i mean some companies like recently even uh, tech resources a big canadian resource giant they're yeah. they're like a third oil they're a third uh, if i remember correctly third oil a third zinc uh, a third copper so I, I mean sometimes you have these companies where it's you know if, if it's a good good old commodity bull market they're yeah. They're making money in all areas, you know, so you like the you kind of have to understand what your company's uh, working on. And that blew off and maybe that wasn't so well known and everybody got the money in it all at once. Right. That, that, that's another thing. I mean, you got to find something people don't understand. That's a, that's an edge. Right. That's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, find the one that has the most oil or something. Right. I mean, if that's if that's if that's the play if, or most natural gas. Right. Or lithium or something like that. That's what we're looking for. So, you know, if, if you're. 
you know, I, I, our styles, I, you know, was a lot of similarities, some divergences. I mean, if you're really going to be short-term swing trading, which is I did what I did for years, yeah. you know, I always loved looking for stocks that actually had kind of a bit of a, a poor structure. They had a lot of debt. You know, if you have a lot of debt on, on the books, if you want to say, I want to find an oil stock that's going to have the most upside, I want to rock and roll, you know, yeah. you want to see the guy with, with, you know, 300% debt levels because this company is like skating on thin ice. And so every, every time that, that, you know, barrel of oil goes up a dollar, so, you know, everyone breathes a sigh of relief. I can pay off my debt. I don't have to close the door. And then the, the value of the company becomes significantly higher as oil goes up. You know, the well-run company actually right. doesn't benefit as to, uh, as as much of a degree as this other company that's on leverage. So the company is basically taking leverage right. on, on your behalf. So if you're that's leveraged cool. on a leveraged company, that's, you know, that's where the fire is. That's the kind of edges and insights we're looking for. We want to see, you know, high debt, it looks bad. But then if the commodity is going up, like you said, that's that's the trigger. That That might be the the key to getting it out of the base, right? When the, the, mm -hmm. the commodity goes up, high debt, relief, boom, demand, uh, you know, so that's I mean, good. You're dealing with a company, it's a little bit of a dynamite in a sense, you know, because if that uh, yeah. price comes down, but you know, especially if you're short-term swing trader, that's, you're not a buy and holder, it's, you know, it's not a long-term investment. Right. If you're looking for that, you know, you really want to benefit, you want to get that maximum exposure, that's yeah. actually how you shift. So ha having this like kind of knowledge of, of the, the the company internals really gives you a, an edge as to how you want to position yourself. Sure, sure. Like I've been I've been trading you know a little short term. I should have held on to EOG. I, I sold EOG into that, switched into uh, WLL, and and just mm -hmm. tried. I think MGY. So as they're all coming out, it's it, you know it's probably better to hold these things as the oil is trending anyway. But with the market so dicey and all that, it's uh, mm -hmm. we're taking the profits where we can get it. But like you said. These things can trend for quite a quite a while as long as the commodity is doing well, right? I mean that's that's the key. So yeah. that you might want to time your sales with the uh, underlying commodity. I guess that's that's the thing to do. So, you know, actually we were talking the other day and we were discussing you know what stocks were strong in the oil patch and and you mentioned a WLL to me and and I had bought some others but I put on my radar because I had missed that that volume breakout and actually I, yeah. I guess thanks to you bringing to my attention I've traded in the past but I wasn't watching I was able to pick it up on that that snap back to the, the top of the base and it's, it's yeah, been a good yeah. trade so far so that was nice. Yeah it got it got really tight and you know there, there wasn't too many setting up in a good base and you know the, the, there's a few that are dropping back in so we'll see if the the price continues we could get a few more out or something like that and what I'm doing right now is trying to get get them out, take a little bit of profit, stop to even see how far I can push it. Right. So we'll be watching the commodities with that and all that. But there, there's other things we want to look at, too, like uh, inflation. Right. I mean, the 10 year yield, you look at it, you know, what other metrics are you looking at to determine if this move is going to be sustainable or, you know, what, what do you think? Yeah. So oil, you know, uh, I think that's where, again, you know, kind of traditional growth, guy, growth people have, are not used to it. You know, oil is more of like a macro type situation. So you have the main players, you have OPEC, you have, uh, you know, the US shale producers, which they know they never, they're not part of OPEC. So they, they have a big, uh, you know, weight in the market. You, you really want to look at what they're doing. And last year with the coronavirus pandemic, when, you know, oil went negative because they had nowhere to store it because demand shut off overnight. These guys got burned. They got burned hard. That's why so many stocks, you know, went into, you know, uh, you know, bankruptcy or restructuring and, and so, you know, the shale, the biggest shale producers, which are, you know, uh, pretty much set the, the trend for the patch, said, we're not increasing oil production here until we see significant demand come. We, we don't want to get caught. I mean, you get caught once, you know, burn me once, shame on, on me, burn me. No, sorry. <laughs> burn me once, shame on you. Burn yeah, me twice, it. shame on me, you know. And yeah, so they yeah. say, we're not going to get out there and put these rigs out there and drill unless we're sure demand is sustainable. And the same thing with OPEC. I mean, these are nation states that, that you know, their, their main revenue source was like dropped to, to zero or negative. And they're not going to just you know put on the tap. So uh, understanding the current dynamic makes it a big difference. So now because that supply is so tight, the mm -hmm. big question right now, and whether this is sustainable or not, and I think it will be, is that if, and I, th I think I may speak for myself, kind of like the Peter Lynch thing, you look around you, I think everyone's tired of this COVID pandemic. And I think the moment governments relent with restrictions and people say like, Hey, I can hit the road again. I can wait, I can go down to Florida Wait, I can go to for a big drive and everything's fine. If that demand turns on, that oil won't be there for, it takes months. I mean, you got to get those rigs out there. You know, the, right. the board of directors have to agree to, okay, I think the demand is sustainable. Do we? So in that short period, that's that shock to the market uh, where basically, you know, similar in the seventies with OPEC, where they took supply away in this market, I think the shock will be that supply is, is already low, but that demand factor can all of a sudden bang, come on, because people are right. just dying to get out there again you know? up and ready to go ready to party i got you yeah, so uh, yeah. what about market cap and you know what type of market cap do you prefer or 
what do you think moves the fastest? Obviously, probably the smaller ones, but I, you- I think the medius part, the medius part of the curve is the yeah. mid caps. The the large caps are going to be safer and they're most liquid. That's great. The the junior yeah. ones. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time in that world when I was, you know, uh, starting out in my career. And 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 sometimes, you know, there's a lot, there's a really a lot of individual company risk at the real junior level. I mean, like, like they're usually they're not actually drilling oil yet. There's there could be permit problems. So that that mid cap are is really the place where they have a lot of upside potential. They probably have you know worse cost structures for with their oil drilling. That's why they're more of a mid cap, and they will usually get the biggest bang for the buck in, in a bull market and the safest bang for the buck, you know? So you want those, you know, let's say between 2 billion and $10 billion. Those are the ones that'll have like a, a, a real great sustainable move. And what, what about like subgroups maybe like, you don't you don't like, I mean, pipelines and, you know, other things like that. I mean, what do you, what do you think to what's, what's that, you know, exploration production or that's the, that's probably the focus group, right? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, that's that's usually you know the best place. You know, whenever you get the pipe pipelines are kind of more of a transportation business. I, like in Canada yeah. here, some of the, the the high yield you know safe stuff safe. I mean, you know, when the oil goes to zero, nothing's that safe. But the the, high, the higher yield safer sets more of a utility almost as the pipeline business. So really, it's like you said that uh, exploration drilling. I know like in past bull markets, if you looked like at 07, 08, like fracking was a new thing, and so all the guys supplying like the um, uh, the equipment for, for oil production yeah. had a great bull market. So, I mean, they could benefit to kind of selling the shovels to the, to the, to the miners in a sense, you know? So, but okay. typically it's oil, oil drilling, oil production. But, uh, if you dig around, you can see kind of who's going to benefit the most. From- so the dr- when did the drillers come into play? Like at what, what point in the, uh, the cycle or, or what, what kind of tips can you give for that? I mean, I, than- I think they're the most sensitive up or down. I mean, that that's, those are the ones that I like to deal with uh, best personally. I mean, like, so, uh, you know, Canadian, Canadian oil was always a great place to play. They had some really dramatic movers because, because, you know, the price of Canadian oil is usually more expensive on the market. So that, they, they naturally have that, like I mentioned before, they have a, a worse cost structure. So they, they, okay. they benefit the most with an upswing, but, uh, like the Canadian oil patches, you know, with, with government policy in Canada has been kind of really hampered. So it's not really what it used to be. In fact, one of the good moving stocks, I think I mentioned to you a few days ago, uh, OVV yeah, was a, a Canadian company good, yeah. used to be called in Canada. They said, you know, we're kind of, we're tired of this, we're leaving, we're going to the United States and, and headquartering over there. And they changed your symbol and uh, they've been doing well. So um, I, I think just, you know, if, if you stick to drillers and, and ex- explorers and people have some good oil production, technically it's going to show up on the chart. I mean, like, look, oil, I think oil just, you know, start to take out the highs from a few months ago today, the better names like Devon Energy, uh, Diamondback, uh, et cetera. I mean, they've been hitting new highs for for days or a few weeks now. Kind of missed a lot of them too. So then now we might be buying laggards if you... You miss the, the leaders. Really. You don't want to buy the laggard. You all, you right. always want to be, you know, in, in the bull market, it's happened. I say, oh, I missed the legal. Always be in the, in the guy who's going up the most. The market speaking. Yeah. That's the guy who's going to benefit most. Price actions came. So, we, you know, I'm buying the, the first to break out and it was like an EOG and then I sold into that and I'm buying the next ones. Now I'm more careful about it coming back on me because I don't know which ones are mm-hmm. you know, the laggards. But, you know, as the oil price pushes you know, and they come out of bases, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to try them. So, I mean, the laggards in a, in a good bull market, the laggards will, will, will go too. Yeah, exactly. But the leader, the leaders are going to, are going to, you know, shock and awe, you know, that, that's the leaders, leaders lead, you know? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Do you want to bring up some charts and, and sure. show some, show some energy charts? And well, I mean, once again, we want to talk about maybe a few that you think are the leaders. So we can kind of you know, narrow our focus here in the space. So let me bring up uh, my, my chart here. Can you see my, my trading screen, my, my chart screen here. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Yeah, that's okay, good. Perfect. So this is the S and P in the top panel. Uh, there's obviously the stock price. Uh, this is the, this is what I use kind of to analyze the market, you know, on the NASDAQ net highs, net lows. You can see that, you know, the, the NASDAQ has been awful. This, this almost every day we've had net lows since, uh, since November. That's what's had me so cautious, yeah. but you know, it, yeah, if, if you take a look at the NYSE, which is a better representation here, if I change that for, for oil companies, I mean, there's still strength in that patch. I mean, yeah, there was some weakness and the NYC is, is, you know, it's not screaming higher, but definitely it's coming through. So, I mean, typically I use the NASDAQ as my benchmark, but I'll yeah. take a look at the NYC if, if, if my main focus happens to be cyclical companies, which is, is well, rare. Value, but value is doing great. So va- value is really uh, ripping yeah. right now. If you put a value chart, like I think I tweeted something like this, so VYM versus like IWO, take like a safe dividend ETF. 
Yeah, it's exactly. It's just in, in, in and the fight and against the IWO. It's like this is outperforming by thirty percent or something on the yeah, on a yeah. year. So uh, you know, I'm actually short the IWO for seven percent now because you know I pretty much know when the growth stocks are off, and that's my main mm-hmm. indicator for that. So that was this <laughs> that bounce and roll wasn't too hard to figure out when everything was kind of going to hell, and you know that that's a short right there, but. Energy is working fine. So, you know, you can have several different markets here. Yeah. And, and so, you know, what I like to really use, I, I think one of the strongest uh, tools you can use is I call it AB relative strength. So basically you just want to look at two points in a chart and, and compare what's going on. So I, here, let me just turn off my, my back indicators here, not to distract people. So, I mean, like this is the, I, I usually love to use the S&P as my main benchmark. And, and you can just see here, like the S&P has been declining over this time. And, and you can just see this powering higher here. It's, it's just been so right. strong. And I, I'll, I'll benchmark my stock versus the S&P. And, and because, um, you know, these are oil stocks, I'll also, you know, kind of study it versus oil. <clears throat> see, you know, is this leading oil? And, and you can see here, I mean, oil you know, had its big drop, this, this stock barely budged. I mean, if the price of oil is going to go from 85 to 66, and then, and these companies don't even budge, that means wow, institutional yeah. investors looked at this company at the oil price said, this is short term. It's a, you know, the, the president Biden released some oil from the strategic, yeah. strategic petroleum reserve it is a short term measure. It's not changing anything of long-term dynamics. Actually, once they release this oil, it just kind of ties their hands and there's not much else they can do. They're kind of like, you know, using up their bullets when they, they shouldn't be. And, and they did. And so the second, and, and so you saw the strength. And so as soon as oil recovered even a little bit, bang, yeah. this went to new highs. And, and so, so we, we should, we should take a note. I mean, you put the crude oil price above an energy stock. I mean, I, I don't absolutely. think a lot of people do that. So I think this is, this is a insight and an edge on, on what we're talking about here. And uh, just, just from what I'm looking at, I trade those types of tight patterns. I actually prefer an undercut in the base towards the end before it gets tight. Yeah. Um, so, so that's that kind of W pattern. If you look that up, uh, th- that just proves to me that there's strong holders in the name because it washed out and undercut the base and was still supported. And it really proves the, uh, the holders are strong. That's just an insight for me. If you want to listen to that, but you know, we'll back, back to, back to the energy store here. I mean, wh- where would you have bought this one? If, if you are in it or are you in it? Uh, I am, I am in the stock. I actually started to buy as we broke above this handle. I use traditional. Okay. Kind of a more of traditional entries yeah that's a great entry i would have bought the same yeah you know the thing is you could have bought on the shakeout here just at the time in december you know you kind of like nasdaq was really falling apart and things were weak right. and, and i like the oil patch but you know yeah i said i'd rather i'd rather wait you know pay a few dollars higher i think these are the leaders i just didn't want to buy kind of things breaking down you know the federal reserve yeah. was saying we're tightening rates and so i just i decided to be a little more cautious but you know, so you don't cash, you know, maybe the ideal perfect entry, but this was still a good entry around, you know, I, I forget the exact price I paid here, 112 something, and we're right. sitting at 129. A similar move on, on Devon Energy. And, you know, I mean, look at oil just breaking down. And every day you're sitting there saying, oh boy, today's gonna be, you know, I've been watching Devon because De- Devon had a, a great move here earlier in the year out of this base here, kind of went straight up. Yeah. And you can see that the volume was just great. I mean, this was a really, you know, strong move. And I remember I'd be watching day to day. I didn't have many positions because the market was weak. I said, oh boy, energy's going to get killed today. It's going to get killed today. And nothing. I said, wow. I said, the second this commodity stabilizes, these are leaders. And what I find most impressive is you're leading against the commodity. Like you break to new highs way before the commodity and you're leading versus the S&P. So you're like kind of a double leader right now. And these are definitely the stocks you want to be in. So you got to put the crude oil price above the stock, everybody, if you're going to trade these, because this, this just shows that the stock knew what was going to happen. It was going to yeah. bounce back and, and, and rip. So uh, good insight there. Yeah. And it's actually even, uh, I forget now which point it was. Um, uh, you know, I'm, instead of just digging around the chart, I'll have to look at it. There's a point that there's points in times where if you see kind of oil, it'll happen at some point as the markets start to top, you'll see oil kind of climbing higher for two or three or four days and the stocks just stop participating. I mean, they won't go up anymore. And then the second oil kind of clicks down, these will break hard at that point. And it's, it's kind of that, yeah. that negative relative strength. So it kind of works both ways. It's just so effective. Right. You right. always want to kind of compare the stock versus the commodity. Right. If, if it's blasting off right here and, and the stock is, is pulling in, it's kind of telling you that might be the high in the price of oil too. I mean, that's what you're at, at least short term. Yeah. yeah short term. Mean it's, it's not a long term yeah, thing. Not but... a long term. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just not, not the good spot, but yeah, this, yeah. this is great. So, um, so, so how do we determine which one's the quality leader perhaps i mean how do you what metrics are we looking at uh, you know balance sheet debt i mean what, what what do you what do we think 
Yeah. So quality leader, it's a lot of stuff with regular companies. Like I said, you know, when, when these companies are, are, uh, you know, showing their, their, their strength, they're going to act just like any other stock that's under uh, accumulation. The thing is that it just doesn't happen often because there's, there's, it's rare that you get these kind of like supply shocks or, or demand shocks to the commodity. Uh, but again, if you really want the quality, say, look, I want to, maybe it's not just a swing trade. I want to be in there a little bit longer. You want to have the liquid names, you know, stocks that trade a lot of volume. You want to have stocks that already have earnings, positive earnings, great earnings forecasting. Like let's take, let's take a look at, um, bang, I'll, I'll bring over my Marcus Smith product. And, you know, there's um, something I like to do is, is just take a look at this and just, just to, you know, people sometimes have a hard time visualizing where can this thing go, you know, but oil companies, you have to think, you know, now we've come back quite a bit from the drops, but this is like a hated sector. It's all about ESG now, right? It's, it's all about, you know, uh, having, you know, stuff that's going to help, uh, this, you know, the environment, which, you know, are, are, are good goals, but in the marketplace, you know, it's kind of the market will always confuse you. If you think, oh, this is definitely going down, it's going to go up. You think this is a, this is a sure lock, it's going up, you can't miss, it's going to go down. And, you know, you can tell that the market right now is not positioned appropriately in, in, in these oils. Because look, look, at, look at 2018, for example. You know, a FANG earned $6 a share, trading at $140 a share. We're currently trading at $129, but they're expecting $17 a share this year. So mm -hmm. even if it just even got to the same price multiple that it did in 2018, you know, like, I mean, you know, you're, you're, you, you, this stock has the opportunity you know, to possibly triple from here. Now, if on top of that, you sprinkle higher oil prices, which means, like I said before, significantly higher earnings. I mean, you, you can get a significant run on some of these companies. I mean, then it's up to the market. Will the market pay the same multiples they did in the past or they have the abandoned the oils patch? My opinion is, Maybe they, they have right now at the moment, but when they start printing money like a, like a cash register, like an ATM yeah. machine, I think a lot of funds are going to say, you know what, uh, ESG, but uh, hey, I, I can make a ton of money and I'll, I'll take that money and I'll buy carbon credits with it or something. I don't know, I'll figure out some way, but uh, I'm getting in those companies. And I think there's, that's your, your major upside. So, so what are maybe some of the less obvious plays, uh, you know, if, if energy is going higher, what gets kind of hurt the most that we don't really realize maybe as a different industry groups or something like that? You know, it's a weird time, you know, like typically, you know, oil is just higher oil prices. I mean, it's great for commodities, but it's just terrible for everything else. You know, I mean, that, that, that affects the cost of everything. Usually transport, transportation gets hammered first, but okay. there's such ma massive supply. You know, that's why, you know, it's kind of the market. I, I like to always say, <clears> you always want to do critical thinking. There's never like a black and white situation. Like you would say, like it's in her transports, but at the same time right now, there's such a supply chain problem that I, I don't right. you know i don't picture like you know transport companies having a problem getting uh, orders you know is it's the cash more like they can't keep up with them so that's that's you know that that's the typical areas that's going to impact things that are very oil intensive or energy intensive i would say but um right now i i think that's why the federal reserve is worrying about tightening because you know uh i i think once oil starts to really run here like i said if demand comes online you're going to see inflation really start to bite the economy and and mm -hmm. then you have a you know, that's why, you know, that's why I'm concerned about NASDAQ and other sectors, because if you have inflation, you have a Federal Reserve tightening, and then people suddenly want to travel and oil spikes, well, now you have higher, higher energy prices, and mm -hmm. that's not a good dynamic, you know? So, I mean, it doesn't, it's not a, it's not a guarantee that's the way the world progresses from here, but I mean, that's, that's my overarching concern. It's definitely not going to be good for the general market. So what do you think right now, more of oil or, you know, natural gas plays? I mean, do you have a, do you have a favorite natural gas play or what, what, what do you think? Yeah, you know, uh, I'd like, Chesapeake uh, earlier in the year. Uh, this is one that came out of a restructuring. It's been really strong. I mean, I was on IBD Live a few times, and I was talking about this as a, as a potential um, a potential winner. And it's been strong. I mean, if you look at uh, natural gas prices in the UK, it's I mean, like record prices. Yeah, it's just uh, it's going to be a rough winter for for them over there. Uh, CRC is another good natural gas play, but the natural gas market is um, much much more volatile than the crude oil market. I mean, that's kind of like uh, the Widowmaker. I mean, I remember back when um, I first started trading on the trading desk, you know, uh, it was 2008 to 2011, that period and commodities were really hot. And we, they started, they had first started these leveraged ETFs it was a brand new thing. And there was one in Canada called h &U. It was like a double, double beta uh, natural gas. And that was like, we also called the Widowmaker. I mean, this thing, like any day, like natural gas itself could be up like enormous, you know, five, 10% a day. And this would be a double. And that was like the guys were like, you know, we're all traders just going crazy. But, you know, some guys trading that I was like, this, that's the little maker, you know. So so if you're a natural gas, I mean, there could be great bull markets, but it's, it's definitely going to be uh, a more harrowing experience than than oil, I would say.
Yeah, and those levered ETFs, uh, everybody has to be careful with those. So maybe the triple lever and all that, you, you, I wouldn't hold them more for a, a week or two because of the decay. I mean, ideally, if you, read the, if you read the prospectus on them, it, it's mostly made for day trading to hold for less than a day. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. But but yeah, I, I'm, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, any, anyone, and, and that's, I feel when they launched it, they didn't properly advertise that or, you know, inform yeah. people that that's, that, that should not even overnight. I mean, as a trader, if I, ever, you know, I, I rarely trade them, I rarely ever did, but it's right. really a day trading vehicle. Even even over a few days with a lot of volatility, it could really Absolutely. hurt Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's that's hundred percent true. So, um, yeah. I don't know. Maybe we could take a look at EOG is one one I trade. Sure. I don't know. You can tell me your thoughts on this one. Uh, got away from me a little bit after I sold it and yeah, moved, yeah. moved elsewhere. But what do we think about this one? And uh, you know, when you look at this sheet on at least on MarketSmith, what does it tell you? And what, what what is important to you? So you know, just so many of the similar things. You had this really nice base here. It was uh, well structured. See, only eighteen percent deep. That's nothing. Like I said, these oil companies, they're typically you know yeah, a little more shallow. volatile. Eighteen percent deep, even though it's a cup. That's that pretty much a flat base territory. That's that's a really well constructed base. And that happened in the face of the Nasdaq falling ten percent. I think over you know not ten, maybe seven or eight percent over a couple of days. So you know that kind of controlled price action is is really something that's strong. Um, and you had that great upside volume that came as it kicked out of this base. I mean, to me, it's just a fantastic breakout. But this is this is a bigger company. You can see, like like I mentioned before, these are the to be the first to kind of break higher. And then after after they have a, you know a successful move, you know, let's say this oil play does continue, then the lower quality names are going to start to really rocket and and take off. And that's, so, which mid cap ones do you, are you thinking about then in the oil space? I like OVV. I think uh, OVV. Yeah, you told me about this one. Yeah. <laughs> I was well, looking at, I, I just couldn't find a spot if you look at the daily. I mean, the weekly looks amazing. So that's a good place to start, right? You always look, check the weekly. You uh, know, so the, I'll, I'll share a, a pattern. I mean, I, I've mentioned it before in other uh, presentations I've done, and I call this a mini coil. So I'll just kind of zoom into the chart here. And it, it's kind of like a hidden breakout. You know, it's a, it's a volatility contraction pattern. So really what it, it's usually at least a three bar pattern. So you have this one range bar here. And uh, let me just take it out of... Um, uh, yeah, it just didn't give me enough drift off. I needed it's a little more wedged up than I was looking for. I was looking for a little more check back and some kind of a handle, at least, you know. Yeah, sometimes that you know that just doesn't form, and so that's why I right. like to use these these alternate patterns. And it's at least a three day pattern, and, and it's really rare to have a stock stay within the range for three days. So you can see this is the high and low of, of this bar here between these black lines. So these two days never broke higher, never broke lower. So you get this really yeah. tight consolidation in a three a three day period it could be four it could be five it's you know yeah. the longer the more rare that happens and when you break out of that i mean typically at least for a short-term entry it's a great place to, to establish a position at least especially for a swing trader short term i've always loved that pattern i've always used it if you look at for example nvidia uh way back here on this this great monstrous leg up here you had that pattern two times that, that it came up so you can see here uh you had that same kind of mini coil right here with this three bar pattern you had a right right down here you know you had three bars in a row so it's kind of like hidden no one will notice it but it's sitting there and it's a great if you like the stock you like the story you like the action you say oh where am i going to get into this thing you know it's a great great technique that i use and um and that's how i i positioned in ovv so i mean i should always say if we have a position actually i'm i'm, I'm long ovv it was upgraded today we broke higher and uh, this is one, again, if we get back to what I was talking about here, $10 billion, you know, it's still a small company you know, right. compared to some others. And, uh, you know, look, look again, you know, back in 2014, you're making almost $7 a share. You were $124. This year, we're expecting eight and a half and we're trading at 41. And if oil keeps climbing, this 842 is going to be upgraded. So, I mean, I, you look at the action, I, I, again, here, 27% deep base, very reasonable, very nice, beautiful yeah. cup. I think, I mean, actually even here, you have the, the blue dot here, the Marcus Smith blue dot. So relative strength, even versus the S&P is there. Funds mm-hmm. coming in quarter after quarter. I think the dynamic in the oil space is just changing and, and all of these stocks are going to be a big. Look at the week. Look how it came down. All the weeks almost closed in the exact same place. I mean, like yeah. it came down, but in such a tight way, it was, this was never sold off aggressively. Very, here. very orderly just, selling. Very orderly selling. You know, completely different. Look at look at these waterfall declines here on the, on the left side as it was being sold. It's like you know, right, right. bang, bang, bang. Here it's like you kind of went up and like oh, it just kind of inches way lower, bought some time, and then and then in yeah. four weeks, you know, four weeks, bang, 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 back to new highs. You know, that's, that's elevator downstairs up, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And it, it, when you see it the opposite, when you see it stairs down, elevator up, you know, something's really going on. That, that's, that's rare yeah. to see, you know? So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So OBV looks good. And uh, let's see, any other insights that, that you could give us in the energy space? Well, you know, if you take a look at just a, uh, you know, I, I think used to be listed in, in uh, the U.S., not even listed anymore. Baytex. I'll look at some like low quality stocks. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't really trade these anymore. Uh, I did for years, but, you know, for, for guys who you know, have all kinds of different you know interests, you know, Baytex, sure, this looks like a, you know, what's this, what's this 30 cent stock Matt's showing us here? If you zoom yeah, back, I don't, go, you know, I don't go below five bucks as a rule. Just I under, I, I, and I don't blame you. Although I, for years I trade all kinds of stuff, but you know, re rewind the clock a little bit. And this was a big Canadian oil company. This was a $60 company. And this, this was, wow. this was the size and, and this was totally crushed. Yeah. Um, again, number of reasons, you know, higher price of, of oil and, you know, the Canadian uh, political climate, let's say for, for oil, uh, you know, uh, companies regardless. Right some of the recent stocks had good moves up this stock i mean look at it on a percentage return this, this stock yeah. just rockets right so that's i mean the junk you know i don't call it junk but you know the lower quality companies yeah. you're gonna get fire in these companies i mean on the upside if, if things get you know really rolling rolling so again you're you're playing with dynamite they're more aggressive stocks but but look yeah. at the character change you know there's a weekly chart look at this base how nice controlled it is versus all the other extremely erratic actions stuck below your averages and then suddenly it's even these smaller stocks there's whoa there's some kind of an accumulation going on here you know it's so, almost a high tight flag but i don't play them with any overhead supply like that so i'm always looking for a base coming off of a low but um yeah one of the you things know, i was yeah, go ahead now i'll say it's funny I, I know you mentioned overhead supply and um yeah. you're right classical technical thing the only thing that I've, I've done sometimes in my studies and i've seen is when you get a washout to this degree i mean this this basically there's, there's nobody holding left nobody yeah, left any, holding that's exactly. right all this all this overhead supply was yeah. people kind of like panicking out and saying get me yeah. out at yeah. any price i don't want to ever see this company that i i mean look i mean in in, in 2019 it was two dollars and if you, yeah. you went down to 30 cents i mean like anyone says i don't want this company anymore get me out i think pretty much look at the volume traded yeah i mean i think the float was turned over well, right? only diamond hands left in the name at that point and then you know they're not going to sell when it gets back to a certain point maybe but that, yeah, that's the like thing I, the psychological levels it says oh i should have sold at five maybe they sell at five you know so you never know not 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 as much as uh with this kind of washout i like i like what you're saying though it makes sense just something to keep in mind sometimes that it's yeah. to such a degree that it almost breaks that prior. And I mean, typically I always avoid overhead resistance to it as a general rule, but sometimes yeah. when you can see kind of like a little tip, a little tactic to keep, to keep, keep in mind, you see such a yeah. monstrous washout and, and you know, that stock was already dumped. So point. in your experience, what type of a, a base would you say is the most common or has, has been the most successful? What type of pattern, you know, what does it look like? How long is the base that you buy that you've had success with? I mean, any clues or thoughts on that with the energy space? No, you know, I, I think really what's important with the energy space, uh, especially if you're, I mean, I know you're yourself and, and, and the crew you work with are a shorter term, term nature. And that was my, my wheelhouse for so long. Right. Like volume, volume cues are really important because, because I said, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it reacts to shocks in the market. This is not a growth story like a Costco. Oh, we're going to open up, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we're going to open, you know, stores in every state and over the next three years, it's not that. It's like right now, yeah, the fireworks right. are there. There's a situation, there's a problem. You want to see volume come in. You want to see these explosive moves. This okay. is a good sector for you, especially with, you know, your, your passion for the high tight flag. I know you got a lot of techniques, but that's that's your signature. But, yeah. you know, this is, this is the kind of place where if it's becoming in vogue, that those are going to show up and you're going to see a lot of those. If you take a look at, um, let's say, uh, an Argonaut Gold, small gold miner. Uh, I remember watching back in the day. If you look at, let's say, um, 2016. And, you know, this thing went, you know, from kind of, it's not the same company. They've, they've done acquisitions and stuff over the year. But from, you know, pennies to, to, 420, to, you know, 420. Let me take off the log chart here. You know, basically, it was like it was rally, 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 flag, rally, flag. You know, here we got a little yeah, bit more yeah, yeah. Uh, erratic, rally, flag. And, and what is typically... Typically, is a is, is a, a terrible sector to be in. I mean, nothing sexy about gold mining. You shock that market and you create a bull market, and suddenly this looks like what was a blockchain right. company a couple <laughs> a year ago. You know what I mean? So right, right. I, I think I mean look at the volume spikes that came up along the way. Fear drives commodity runs because fear drives commodity runs. If you get into a true commodity bull market, the mid cap, small cap names are going to have runs like this. 
and uh, I mean, you could have a real party in there if you know if you know how to how to awesome. be tactical. Yeah, I mean, there, there was only there's only two I have. So WLL, I don't know if you have time to bring that up. We could do that one and, sure. and, and take a look, uh, see how I traded it. it. I mean, I got in as low as I could get because I knew I'd have to move the stop to even. So on that on that big volume bar, I bought it just slipping the prior day's high. Oh, nice. Did a little even on the flag there. So yeah, um, I, I sold uh, half of it right at the top of that bar, basically, um, j just to you know, get myself comfortable and maybe look at some other energy stocks and move the stop. But I want to let this go as far as I can now with the rest right. of it. So, so I'm, I'm trying to get positioned for that. And like you said, the volume, the volume coming in is, is key. You know, you have a little bit of a drift off and, uh, you know, the undercut there on, I don't know what day that is, the 16th or somewhere around there, uh, in the pattern, uh, and the low there, like the under, we're undercutting oh, right yeah, kind of there. Right. Yeah. The little yeah. wick off spring or whatever you want to call that. Yeah. That, that kind of showed the, the, the strong hands in the name. And I always love that. And then with a, with a, just a tight area after that, uh, however I can buy that. So, um, I don't know what you think about this one. If you have any thoughts or know, know the company since we talked or uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about it. Yeah. I mean, like actually you brought up, I mean, it's, it's a stock I traded. I, I was trading it back. Um, I think it was on the up leg here. I had a position at one point, uh, but I didn't have a position now. And actually when you brought it to my attention, I was busy with, uh, I had positions in Devon and, uh, diamond back because I think those are the leaders over this. You know, mm. they broke out first. They I think they're they're smoother. Not that it can't do well, but you brought it to my attention. A good pattern is a good pattern. So there was this nice mini coil, like I spoke about. You see here, we had this this big range bar. Then you had three days inside. We broke out with volume. So actually, when you brought, it, I said, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna put my limit orders in. If you can come and retest this breakout and the high of the base, I'll get long. So yeah. I actually got long yesterday, seventy two and a quarter. So this it's good. acting well so far today. We'll see if it it holds. Uh, I, I just, I don't think it's the leader in the space. Um, yeah. I think you'd have a good move. Uh, that's why I, I, I bought some. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm concerned with. I feel like I'm a little late on these few because I got rid of EOG early. Uh, if you see, if you bring up EOG, I'll, I'll show you. I mean, now it, it just gets extended. Uh, I don't have an entry now. I sold into some of that. Yeah. And then another two or three bars passed where I sold it. And, uh, you know, like, oh, I should have held it, of course. But, you know, tough market. So you take a couple, yeah. couple points. Uh, the other one was that I think feel like I'm really late on is um, uh, M. What's it called? M G W Y. I think M G Y. Is that's it, right? M G Y. M -G -Y? Magnolia Oil and Gas. Uh... Yes, I think so. Okay. Yeah, this one here. Yeah. Yeah, I bought that today. Coming out a little bit of volume. I mean, maybe not even not quite the pocket pivot thing, but you know, it's mm -hmm. getting up there. And I might be late on this, but you know, this has the undercut. It's got the tight area. Maybe some VCP to it. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm getting in this one and I feel like I'm late, but you know, it's, it's doing okay so far, <laughs> you know, well, but, you know, but that's, that's the sign of a bull market, right. Or, or, or a potential bull market. I mean, you know, as, tra as traders, I'm never uh, an analyst saying this has got to happen. If the market starts to turn, I'll yeah, get out yeah. and move out. But, but whenever you see not one stock break out, like, you know, you know, Devon was one of the first stocks to break out. That's why I bought it. You know, same with Diamondback. You're talking EOG. Those maybe are the leaders, but yeah. if the trend's going to be real, you're going to see, you know, there's a lot of oil stocks. You see breakout, 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 breakout. Sure. And so the more of these breakouts come along, just like after the, the March 2020 bottom, the COVID bottom, it was like tech stock, breakout, bang, 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 bang. And that kind of breadth within the industry mm -hmm. kind of tells you that mm, there's something going on. It's not one company that's kind of executing well. It's like this is money being kind of like shotgun blast into the industry. It's like where we want a, a little bit of piece of everything. I'm going to spread my money out. I'm going to, you know, that way you get geographic diversification. Some guys have oil in, in one area versus another or different cost structures or these big funds say, look, I'm going to kind of shotgun my money across the industry. And you, those constant breakouts, that's to me is a great sign. Doesn't mean short term, you're going to get extended. You're going to need a pause. You're going to need a little bit of a break. I think they're getting a little bit hot here, yeah. um, but it's a good sign. It's a sign that it's a sign that the trend is up and that's confirming that trend. So that, that kind of technically says that I'm going to look for additional entries. Great. Well, uh, if you have any other insights, we'd, we'd be happy to hear, but I think we're, I think we're getting there. I mean, we're, we're, uh, we got a couple to write down. We'll probably write it down. Uh, all, all the metrics we're looking at. I don't know if you want to talk about maybe like where to, um, Talk about overall oil demand, you know, for the world and stuff like that. You, you know, if you want to check that out or explain that to, to swing traders that are imagine I'm clueless and how do we determine the world oil demand and the supply and all that? Where, where do we look? You know, the best place, uh, I mean, you can get really complex. But, you know, I like to listen to what the CEOs of, of the oil companies are saying. Let's some okay. some conference calls. They're going to tell you. I mean, OPEC, you know, you can read the headlines, see what they're doing. 
I mean, recently there was a spat with, you know, President Biden was trying to get OPEC to, to, to pump more oil. Whenever you're dealing with these kind of, you know, sovereign nations, they can always kind of do whatever they want, right? I mean, Saudi Arabia, Russia can do what they want with oil. I mean, it's, it's their call, but, right. you know, they also want to keep that credibility. So if they, similar to when the Federal Reserve talks, you know, or anybody, if they say we're going to do something, it's going to take a lot for them to kind of change on on a dime because they don't want to lose that credibility. So whatever they say is, is you know, typically fairly accurate, I would say. I mean, you never know, but, you know, same with, you know, with the, the shale producers, listen to some of the, the bigger names, go listen to like, you know, Devon Energy, you know, EOG, what are they saying? And, and they've really been, you know, Diamondback Energy, they've been really saying, we're going to be cautious. We're not going to be just, you know, pumping oil like crazy. We're not increasing oil rigs. Our focus yeah. is on returning money to shareholders. So that, you know, you got to read between the lines. That means a tight supply market. Now for demand, you know, we're in such a unique time. Demand is, I think everyone just saying, I want to, I want to leave my house again. I'm tired yeah. of being, I mean, it depends where you are. There's some places like Florida where I, you know, I, I hear things are pretty normal. And there's other places like I'm here. I'm in Florida Delta. right now. It's, it looks oh. pretty good to me. I, I don't have to wear a mask or anything. So, you know, up until uh, until Monday, the province I'm in, we're under curfew at 10, at 10 p.m. We have to be in, indoors. I mean, it's just madness. But yeah, that's, I, that's, I mean, that's a whole other topic. But just to say there's a lot a lot of areas of the world that are, are still, you know, oil demand is restraining because people are, are not driving, not moving. If that if that comes on again, full force, maybe you get into yeah. springtime people want to move and, and get out again. And yeah, yeah. if that supply is tight, that now the consumer is the really big swing factor in the situation. You know, there's not always a shortcut. You got to, you have to have, have to read what are the main drivers at this point in time for demand supply for, for oil and it kind of takes a bit of experience and, and, you know, sitting down and strategic, strategic thought, you know, but you, you can get there if you. Okay. Uh, one, one of the things my, one of my members asked me was uh, how do you consider the, the U S dollars influence on commodity prices and like, when is it favorable for these stocks versus not? Just a just a general kind of overview of that, if you have any ideas. Yeah, so typically, uh, you know, a week a week or uh, U.S. dollar is is favorable for all commodities. I mean, commodities are priced in dollars, and so whenever there's inflation, inflation is typically a weakening of the U.S. dollar. And you know, if, if inflation is coming around and and your dollars are going to be worth less, you don't want to hold on to dollars. And um, in an uncertain environment, you want to put that money to work somewhere where you know that there's going to be a store of value because you don't you don't trust your dollar. Let's say in an extreme an extreme situation. Sometimes they buy they buy oil, right? With, with yeah, I mean oil. If we're gonna you know you got to turn your car on. You got to you know so right. oil is that that store of value and mm -hmm. and that's going to play in that favor. I mean, it's different commodities. There's a different degree of that, but also again, you're dealing with sovereign nations in oil, like let's say OPEC. And they're going to say like, hey, look, you know, United States of America or whatever, you know, you're, you're right now it's every country in the world printing money like crazy. But, you know, our oil is still still our oil. We're, your car is still going to start with the same barrel we give you, but the money you're paying us is is worth less. So they may say, like, you know, unless we get a higher price per barrel, we're not we're not in a hurry to go back to forty dollar oil because that's that forty dollars is not the same forty dollars. I can't buy the same amount of groceries when I go to the store. So. So that that changes the the discussion. You know, it's kind of hard for the president, you know, to go to OPEC and say lower prices when OPEC can come back and say, well, stop devaluing your dollar. And, and that's that that's why, you know, a, a devaluing dollar, a falling dollar, you know, whenever that that confidence starts to happen, that pushes money into commodity sectors. OK, Matt, well, that, that was very insightful, all this stuff. And we're going to try to figure out all the metrics we talked about, make a list. So. Swing traders maybe have a little, a little better um, guide to trade energy stocks. Uh, where, where can everybody find your stuff? Uh, Caruso Insights, if you want to. Yeah, CarusoInsights.com. I, I put out uh, an educate, it's like a video course, 10 hour course. I kind of detail everything that I do, um, you know, how I approach markets. It's kind of 10 hours of uh, from, from step one to from A to Z. And uh, in February, I'm going to be launching kind of a, a real-time market product where I'm going to be, you know, video calls twice a week and uh, daily updates kind of thing. So that's going to be launching in February. So it's a lot of exciting stuff. Very nice. And follow Matt on Twitter. And uh, yeah. this, this is a little bit just for, you know, finance, Twitter, swing traders in general. I hope you got some insights out of it. Big thanks to Matt. Uh, we'll see you guys later. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks.